people to get right. See, a lot of people give up on the gravy. You cannot give up on the gravy. No gravy, no pie. Simple as that. I've got a, uh, I can taste chips forming my mouth. I think it's coming out my nose as well. <laughs> and welcome to the 2D cast. Uh, <laughs> we are Irish Comic News, following the Merit.com and anywhere else you may find us. I'm Kieran Marcantonio and uh, shooting foam out of his eyeballs. We have Mr. Uh, Kieran Flanagan here. What's up, well, Hi, Hi guys, how you doing? I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm having a difficult evening. Yeah, and no noticeable by his absence is uh, Hair Bobby Star this evening. Yeah, he's he's off doing the comedy in I believe Galway, which is which is great for him. You know, good for him. Good for him. Go make people laugh, Bobby. Sorry, we can't be there. I, I'm not sorry. If you've you ever been to a stand-up comedy competition? <laughs> no, I haven't. Like, fuck, they're the, they're the worst. No, no, no. Don't get me wrong. Like they're they're a lot of fun uh, to. To, like go and watch but performing in them is just fucking absolutely soul destroying just you know like 20 people who would fucking climb over one another just you know to get like a moment of fucking laughter from anyone in the audience uh, I'm getting I'm getting back I'm getting back into that game. So stab him Bobby stab them all and do us proud uh, how have you been how's your ma How's my mum? Well, well, my mum is still sick. She's got the, um, what we've, we've now found out is the pneumonia. Oh, uh, and uh, Yeah, yeah, I was up looking after her. Uh, we watched Star Trek, the 2009 one, because she uh, wanted to take a break from being in bed, because she'd been in bed a lot. So we got up, and we watched Star Trek, and uh, she was very impressed by that uh, Zachary Quinto lad who was doing his, his, his Spock thing, as she called it. He's very good at it. Very good at the old Spock. <laughs> I recently listened to the audiobook of uh, that uh, yeah. adaptation by Alan Dean Foster, the great man of uh, sci-fi and movie adaptations. But uh, the audiobook, I was like, I was like really impressed. Oh, you put the splinter of the mind's eye. Sorry? Go for it. Sorry, I was just sing singing the praises of my favourite Alan Dean Foster is Splinter of the Mind's Eye. Oh yeah, well that's, that's a good one, I've actually read that one. And also, uh, I really like the, he did the adaptation of Alien, the original Alien, with all the, you know, with all the stuff about, like, uh, Dallas turning into an egg and stuff. Really good. But, uh, the, the, like, you know, the guy was, the actor was doing, uh, you know, it's like, oh, this is quite good, you know, like, like he, he's, he's alright, you know, he does a fairly good, uh, he does a very good Kirk, and, you know, uh, his Scotty's not so hot, he, he can't handle, you know, he can't manage the Scottish accent, didn't think much of his fucking uh, Spock, you know, it was like, that's a bit weak, so uh, I finished listening to it, and the credits came up, <laughs> read by Zachary Quinto. Oh dear. Oh dear! <laughs> and don't get me started on the Star Trek uh, Into Darkness uh, adaptation read by Alice Eve. Alan. That, that's that's going to get that, that. It's going to rear its ugly head again, Flanagan, because I promised Mad it will watch Into Into Darkness next week, and she knows now. She knows now. I'll, I'll keep. I'll let's keep. See. I'll keep Stu. Well, let's stop. I'm let's stop because she's quite the fan of Ricardo Mottlebaum, Is my mother? Well, she, quite uh, as well. She should be. <laughs> So, uh, uh, no Bobby this evening, which means we can, you know, we can talk seriously as men. Uh, as men! I, I was going to say, let's just, just talk about Bobby's embarrassing things on Facebook during the week. Let's just slag him about the fact that yeah, he tried to do a nice thing for his future wife. Right in there. I love you on the windscreen, in the snow. And then it snowed again and it was gone. So she didn't even know it was... <laughs> well, I'll go one further. She didn't even care. <laughs> <laughs> We love you, Neve. Keep torturing Bobby. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Well, there's a lifetime of torture ahead. <laughs> We're just gonna... I'm gonna... I'm gonna throw my idea out there for this evening. Let's talk about what me and you have been... Let's, let's, let's face it. What me and you have been consuming like absolute bastards since the start of February. Uh, I'm gonna welcome myself back to the fold because I've never been... I haven't been this deep in, into wrestling in a long time. Um, to be truthful, since Chris Benoit passed, 
and uh, I've been I've been lured back in by you boys over time, and this week I just I've I've just the dam broke. I got the WWE Network. I'm like, God, it's glorious. It is. It's really, uh, it's, re- oh. it's really, really good. No, um, let, let's try and keep it. You know, it, it's not. It's not going to be a suck fest. Let's try and keep it sort of analytic here. Um, firstly, uh, its value for money this month is second to none because it's it's free. So if you, uh, it's free until uh, March first. So I mean, for that reason alone, I recommend that you sign up and then. If you don't like it, cancel. But but do give it a try because uh, it's a it's a lot a lot of fun. It's got it's just got a hell of a lot of very interesting content on it. I'm a big one for documentaries in relation to wrestling now because essentially the guys that are wrestling now, to me, all look like white bread clones of each other. And I'm only interested in a couple of the modern wrestlers like Bray Wyatt, um, Daniel Bryan. Um, for some reason, Dolph Ziggler is I'm I like that guy. I don't know why, but I do. You know that way? Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know who? He, do you know who he is? Do you remember this? No. Do you remember the Spirit Squad? Oh God, really? Yeah, he's Nikki from. Oh like, God, Nikki from the Spirit. Yeah, no, my my brain just twigged it. Holy shit! Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I've been I've been watching it on uh, my Apple devices, and I've got a few minor a uh, few minor quibbles. Uh, there, there's no uh, there's no chapter selection, which bums me out because uh, you're forced to fast forward like thirty seconds at a time, which is not great. I don't know. What are you watching it on? Well, I've mostly been, I've watched it across two platforms mainly. Uh, my main desktop, which is my tel- my big television at home, um, which I have plugged into a desktop, and that is a fucking dream to watch. Let me tell you, it's um, it's the I. I I dis- well, on desktop versions, obviously, it does have chapter selection. So it may just be an app issue. I, I've also been using it on my HTC One M8 uh, through the WWE app. Um, and it, I found that to be quite the joy as well to use. It works well on Dublin Bus Wi Fi. Um, so <laughs> I've been enjoying it. Literally, uh, pretty much everything I've watched since about Saturday has been wrestling related. And I haven't watched that much wrestling related stuff. In a long time, I've watched through. Um, I watched the Ultimate Warrior uh, documentary with my brother. Um, oh, the, the feels. Oh, oh, the feels. But, well, that's it. I, I I wanted to see if my brother still had human emotions. He does. Good. I knew it. <laughs> um, but I've watched that. I've watched through uh, the rise and fall of ECW because the first place I go whenever I go to wrestling is ECW section to see what's going on. Um, I've rather enjoyed also the ECW Exposed series that's running as an original show, uh, which is hosted by Paul Heyman and Joey Styles. And I've really, I've only started to get into actual WCW stuff now. I've started, I watched the NWO documentary. Uh, I've watched the first four parts of the weekly running series, the Monday Night Wars. Um, so so far, we're just up to Shawn Michaels drops the belt and his back to um, stop and call Steve Austin at WrestleMania and ends or ends his run with DX. So that's where I am in the Monday Night Wars. Um, I've also watched a Randy Savage documentary, a Sting documentary. Um, yeah, I've watched a lot of stuff actually. Now I'm tallying it up. Yeah, it's it's pretty sweet. Uh, if I can recommend something for you, if you can, there's an original programming called uh, From the Vault, in which uh, Joey Styles goes to the warehouse where they keep all yep. the props and stuff and just every week looks at some amazing thing that they used once upon a time. Really good. Highly recommended there for fans of wrestling. And guys, it's free. It's free. 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 And, and if, if, if there's anything else to lure you to it, this was the big lure for me, right? Um, during the mid-2000s, uh, late early 2000s uh, to mid-2000s, actually after the company had folded, ECW began to become really prominent in Ireland and England through uh, DVD sales, back-end sales that were going on. Uh, so people were discovering it. And I ran all over goddamn Dublin to every shop I could find looking for ECW pay-per-views because I was loving them. I was devouring them um, whole. And uh, on the WWE Network, the one part of the ECW empire that never made it over to Europe is now there for you to stream the entire back catalogue of ECW's Hardcore TV. I will, and, I've been watching some episodes. It's it's to, to watch what was considered to be like edgy 
in uh, 1995 is it, <laughs> it's it seems it seems so cool at the time. Well, this this network for me, right? Here's what stands out about it. You can dip in to absolutely any era of of history in WCW, ECW, or WWF, WE, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you can literally, if you were a fan of the Attitude Era of WWE, you can jump in there. If you were a fan of the ECW Era, if you were a fan of the Monday Night Wars, you can jump in and watch a couple of Nitros. It's it, you you can pick and choose. You can literally pick and choose what you what you. For a long time, wrestling fans were forfeit whatever was there. Yes. You couldn't choose what you wanted to watch. And this network provides you the ability to choose what you want to watch. And also is highlighting some new guys. I'm I'm really intrigued by the WWE NXT division, which exists only on the network now, uh, which is up and coming guys. Essentially, it's, it's a transference of their Ohio Valley Wrestling developmental territory, but they're doing it on the network. It has a show. It's got a general manager, William Regal, for God's sakes. Um, so it's got a really, really broad amount of original content, back catalog content, and of course, you get your pay-per-views and you get your main Raw and SmackDown, if that's what you're into. Um, yeah, I, I'm the only thing I can't find on the network, and I will fault you for it, and I will call you out on it until the day it comes back online, because it should they've whitewashed everything Chris Benoit out of there uh, it's, I wouldn't hold your breath on it I just I know, I know, it's just one of those things, like the greatest fatal, the greatest tables, ladders and chairs four way that ever happened in WWE happened on a Smackdown with Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero versus Edge and Christian, Matt Hardy and uh, Jeff Hardy and the Dudley Boys that match is gone yeah, it was, sorry it was Benoit and Jericho, not. Uh, it was Benoit. Yes, it was the Chris and Chris connection. Sorry. Yeah, or I, I just called them Canadian violence connection. <laughs> yeah, that works too. Yeah, it's it's really good. So I recommend that. Also, additionally, for anybody who's wanting to broaden their horizons, rest and rise. Uh, New Japan World, the New, New Japan streaming service, is also free for February. Uh, so pick that up too. Yeah, it's 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 really good. Really good. Uh, right. What else? Well, that covered all of 15 minutes, not even. I thought it would go a lot longer, considering I've just been watching so much wrestling. It's wrestling. Yeah, wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. Rest. Well, what about comics? You've been catching up on comics, you said, uh, with a particular focus. Uh, rather big stack here beside me of comics that I've actually read in the last week because I've been um, I've had the time to so starting off um, I shall review Spider-Man 2099 issue 6 uh, the first part of Spider-Man 2099 to cross over with the Spider-Verse storyline that, that I previously reviewed um, it's done by Peter David as a writer and Will Sliney on art and it is absolutely lovely uh, Will Sliney is bringing his goddamn A game to Spider-Man 2099, um, and this issue, is, as far as I can see, it Will's doing some of his best stuff right now. Uh, um, in this particular issue, he gets to draw what I can only describe as a steampunk Spider Woman. Yes, she's amazing. Um, she is really, really good. I, I, I've totally taken to that character. Uh, she's also a May Parker, uh, but she's from 1895 New York. Brilliant. Okay. Um, and we also have a six-armed Peter Parker, straight up classic Spider-Man, with six arms. <laughs> and uh, it's a really good story. It's tying into the larger Spider-Verse story, so I won't give away any spoilers in relation to it. But it does contain one of Morland's family chasing after them uh, in 2099. Go check it out. Really good book. Um, I'm going to pick up the next issue this week as well, so I'll have a review of that for next week. Do you know something? Uh, we should have uh, we should have Will on some of these fine days because I'd really like to pick his brain about uh, the minutia of taking a, a, a title that's being worked on already. I suppose the writer would be really better to talk to, but sort of coordinating things with the larger editorial issues that are going around, like a big crossover like that, be really interesting well, to find that out. Yes. Will's really on the pulse of that particular issue right now because as of today's announcement uh, The Secret Wars announcement, yeah Spider-Man 2099 is going to evolve into Secret Wars 2099 uh, Will released on his Facebook today and on Twitter, go have a look um, 
a couple of images of uh, redesigned characters um, from the 2099 verse that he has done, and they look absolutely great. Uh, so yeah, he, he's, I mean, literally he's taking the book that he's currently on now and evolving it into the bigger crossover, so I'd be very interested to talk to Will too and see what his perspective is on that. Um, I also know that he, he jumped on X Factor for, for the last issue, and I haven't managed to read that one yet, um, but I, I heard it was really good too. I think that was from me in the last episode, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now, um, also read, I have read all new X Men issue 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Um, the best way to describe this particular arc of all new X Men. Um, is to describe it quite simply as this um, they jump universes into the ultimate universe and recruit Miles Morales I uh, yeah I've, I've been following that one quite closely um, I'm really quite enjoying it and I'm also yep. there's, there seems to be an awful lot of uh, like double takes going on it's like but what oh my god he, uh, but you uh, me oh you're Jean Grey I'm Jean Grey. Ah! All, all that. There's been a lot of that since the start of All New X Men. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm sure most do, but for those who don't know, uh, All New X Men is based on the premise that the original five X Men have time jumped into the current era of the Marvel Universe and are attempting. They can't, for whatever reason, go home. Their time seems to be blocked from them. And now um, the team has begun to break apart. Cyclops is off in space, and the remaining part of the team are bunking up with the Uncanny X Men in. Um, Scott Summers' secret school in the former Weapon X program, um, and these partic this particular set of X Men are interesting to me. Why? Because they're the original X Men, and they've come to the future. They see all of the, 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 the let's face it, the shit that happened to them over the last twenty or so years, and they don't like it. They don't want that to be their future. Yeah. And they can't go home. We still don't know how this story is going to play out. And to to quite frankly, it's a Brian Michael Bendez absolute. Um, love fest for his characters he's brought Miles Morales in and to be quite honest Miles Morales works very well with them I think so far um, the art is absolutely killing it on these books so I want to give a huge shout out to Mahmoud Asar um, he is killing it he had the hard job of taking over from Sarah Pacelli uh, and Imamin before him um, and He's he's really killing it. I love the art style of what's going on in these books. Um, again, don't want to give too much away in relation to the actual story. Um, if you're interested in the original X Men and you're interested in Miles Morales, um, check it out. It's um, Bendis is playing some interesting games with uh, how the younger characters interact with the older versions of themselves. Like the two things have sort of jumped out to me in particular that I think he's having a lot of fun playing with. Uh, the first is that. Everybody thinks Iceman, the younger one, is really annoying, including the older version of Iceman. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the older version of Iceman. And, uh, it, well, you see, this has been interesting in that because this story has been taking place from a perspective of the present, but a future team of X Men have also come back and they had an Iceman with them too. Um, but it's interesting because it's forced the younger X Men to start to develop their abilities far younger than when they originally did, as in develop them further. In this, in the most recent issue, Iceman manages to create the young Iceman manages to create an entire army of essentially ice hulks uh, to fight off. Because he, in the process of jumping universes to the Ultimate Universe, he lands himself in the middle of the Mole Man's domain with loads of moloids everywhere. The the other thing that's really interesting to me is um, the relationship between young Jean Grey and uh, older Scott Summers. I think. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, on this perspective, uh, the more interesting part to me is the relationship between current White Queen Emma Frost and young and Jean, younger Jean Grey. Yeah, well, that that was partly what I was alluding to, but you know, it, it, it's just it's like that psychic battle in the in the second to last issue. Oh, that was wonderful. That was. Yeah, it's the whole thing's just like it's the most convoluted love triangle that uh, I've ever experienced, and it's I think something that could, yeah. that could be really developed. You know, in some interesting directions. Additionally, it's been really good at telling really, really messed up but workable relationship stories. Look at Rogue and Gambit. You know, yeah. Look at Grey Cyclops and and White Queen previously in their pre, you know, in their full-grown adult incarnation. 
it, they really have managed to work these relationships in such a way as to, and keep them interesting. I'm, it, I'm all behind Cyclops. Cyclops is one of my favorite characters at the moment, and um, any aspect of his story is interesting to me right now. By the same token, uh, I think the, the X titles actually it, it's the directions that they're all going separately are the most diverse they've been in the. Uh, in well, this is a very I, long I, time. I made a point of reading each book individually and d taking on about six months worth of each book uh, because they've just been sitting there and I hadn't had a chance to read them yet, so I devoured them all. Um, I've also read issue from the next batch, uh, <clears throat> Uncanny X-Men issue 24, 25, uh, 26, 27, 28, and the Uncanny X-Men annual. Uh, also written by Brian Michael Bendez, um, with a lot of art by Chris Anka. Um, to, and Chris Bicello took over from issue 25 up to current um, again telling the story This in the, uncan the way the teams are broken up is like this all new X-Men focuses on the younger X-Men that are camped down with Scott Summers current team Uncanny X-Men deals with Scott Summers current team um, the other X books, X Men, uh, deals with an all female team working out of the Jean Grey school. We'll get back uh, to that in a minute. Yep. We'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, so we've done all new X Men. Here's Uncanny X Men. So, Uncanny X Men, uh, or the book that is really dealing with it, it, it starts with the fallout of the reading of Xavier's Will. Um, two wonderful bombs were dropped during the reading of Charles Xavier's Will. Um, which forced the currently warring schools of X-Men to come together because the, the stipulation of the will was that it was read in front of several members. Several members that are scattered across multiple teams that pretty much hate each other since the fallout of Xavier's death. Uh, so Scott Summers has to return to the Westchester school for the reading of the will. And the bombs that are dropped are this. Turns out a couple of months before he died, Charles Xavier married Mystique. Oh yes, I remember that. Uh, and second bomb um, turns out Charles Xavier and all of his preaching and all of his we will accept every mutant we will train every mutant we will teach them how to be themselves and be out there in the world turns out he encountered an omega level mutant that was so so powerful his ability was to draw energy from another dimension and channel it through ours thus ca causing a massive destructive wave to emanate from him whenever he accessed his powers um the kid's name was Mallory. Mallory? What's his name? Marcus Mallory? Quinn Mallory? Yeah, Quinn. He looked a bit like Quinn Mallory, actually, now that you mentioned Oh, extra, uh, extra dimensional energy. Quinn Mallory. Matthew Malloy. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, Matthew Malloy. This new mutant is born, and he is absolute Omega level. But what registers to S.H.I.E.L.D. as a new mutant being born, and here's the rub of the thing. Xavier had pulled what I'm going to call a, a Jean Grey on this kid. Um, he had visited him since he was a small child because he first developed his powers when he was eight years old. <clears throat> and he had placed mental blocks on his abilities to stop him from having access to his powers because in Xavier's own world, words, this mutant was too dangerous to exist, but he didn't have the will to put him down. So, now that Xavier's dead, all of the mental blocks that he had put in place are breaking down. And an incident happens that causes this mutant to access his powers and kill absolutely everything and everybody within a 10 mile radius, thus attracting S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, so S.H.I.E.L.D. are forced to team up with the uncanny X-Men led by Cyclops to try and deal with this situation. Um, interesting in that it, it changes the perspective on Cyclops a little bit more towards that villain angle that they Mar Marvel have been trying to push him in for a while now in that Scott Summers feels absolutely betrayed by Xavier because of what he has done and and then, decides, oh my god this is you know this is the same Scott's color scummers oh, sorry the same <laughs> the same don't you dare call him Scott Scummers the same Scott Summers that killed Xavier killed Xavier while possessed by the Phoenix Force wasn't him was the Phoenix I'm with Cyclops on this one. Oh yeah, I agree, but uh, you know, it, um, it's just... It... And there are actually some interesting points in relation to that raised during the course of this story in that 
certain members of the X-Men have begun to realize that Scott Summers is seriously going through post-traumatic stress because of it and may not be in his right mind because he hasn't had the chance to grieve and lost his entire world in the process. Um, interesting. It's a really good story and it ends or it comes to a crescendo when Cyclops decides that he has the best angle on how to recruit this kid and calm him down and shield panic because the guy who started the mutant revolution just walked away with the most powerful mutant discovered in the last 50 years. Yeah, sounds interesting. I think the the angle there that plays to me most is the idea that throughout his history in the Marvel Universe, Charles Xavier has been one shady motherfucker. He's oh man, the shit that guy's done. But he's got away with as well. Yeah, but and that's and that's actually the core of what Cyclops' argument is in this situation. Cyclops is enraged by the the reading of the will because he comes out of it with the with a specific instruction is given for a specific team to go and find this mutant and bring him under their care because if he's dead if Xavier is dead then he knows the, the blocks are going to break down yeah. so that team is made up of Logan Cyclops, Storm and I believe Rachel Gray um, specifically Rachel Gray because they need a telepath to try and calm him down yeah. um and Cyclops and Wolverine, as we well know at the moment, are essentially the professors of the two separate schools. Well, Wolverine's dead now, but you gotta admit, I, I was catching up on six months worth of Uncanny X-Men, so Wolverine's still prevalent in this story. Um, it's really, really good. I enjoyed it. It came off like a new approach to old X-Men, and I, lo I, I in my mind, Uncanny X-Men is the flagship X-Men book. Always will, was, always will be, always should be, and to my in my humble opinion it's the best series out of the X-Men that I'm reading at the moment okay old lady X-Men then on to Brian Wood's X-Men um, this is actually coming to the end of a storyline and starting a new one uh, so we have from issue 17 18 19 and 20 I still have 21 and 22 to read I couldn't read them on the bus home there was an annoying child um, <laughs> <laughs> there's always an annoying child on the bus yeah. again written by Brian Wood uh, and from issue 18 it's written by Mark Guggenheim if you know the name Mark Guggenheim it's because he's the executive producer and main writer of uh, DC TV's um, Arrow what's that? Arrow the guy who, Arrow. Arrow yeah you know that, that thing with that lad who gets his shirt off a lot and fires arrows at people it's not going to work it's never going to catch him <laughs> Uh, we'll make it like Batman. It's grand. Okay. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. Arrow. Okay. <laughs> Arrow. So, right, so. Um, what's been going on there? Now, the last, um, the last story arc of that that I was well, that was uh, they had a really interesting death, uh, death strike story going on there. Did they not? They did. Now it's it's actually come on a long way since then. Um, that death strike story finished itself out a good while ago, and the the main core of the story has been uh, Storm's daughter from the future is now part of has come to the team. And uh, she brings with her, as all characters from the future do when they turn up in X-Men, uh, bad tidings of what's coming. Um, recently in the X-Men, um, Jubilee has adopted a wayward child by the, that she is calling Shogo. And the, this story kind of revolves around the biological father of Shogo breaking out of prison and coming for him. Uh, he happens to be a mutant by the name of, goes by the name of the future. The, the um, what? The future. The future. He's like the biz in WWE. Thinks he's great, bit shit, but a bit of a threat. And he's fathered uh, a child that's now being raised by shit vampire Jubilee. Shit is vampire in Marvel. Do you know what? I, they, they missed a beat here because, you know, sparkly vampires were real popular a few years ago. Yeah. Right? Real popular. And Jubilee's been a vampire for about six years now, right? Yeah, that's right, and Christopher. Stand... That's right, Christopher. Six years. <laughs> that's it. To my mind, um, that that crosses over with that Twilight phenomenon, but they missed to be here because when they made her a vampire, they took away her mutant abilities. Well, no, she lost her uh, mutant abilities on M Day. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. All right, right. So you've now got a vampire who could have uh, theoretically shot sparkles out of her freaking fingers. Yeah, she was. Uh, before that, she was in the revamped version of the New Warriors. Wandra, she was, I believe. Wandra. Oh. Well. Despite the shit vampire tendencies, um, Jubilee is still very much so Jubilee, and to see her go, coming from perspective of trying to raise a child um, is very interesting, considering when I came into the X-Men, 
Jubilee was one of the freshest recruits. And she said she was only like 14 whenever she uh, she first showed up, wasn't she? Yeah, back in the 90s, man. So um, it's interesting for me to see that character where she is now in her life in Marvel, if you know what I mean, um, in that she's now raising a child. And that child um, essentially has is the key to stopping this situation with his dangerous mutant father, the, the future. Uh, but I'm going to leave that story there because this this arc that I read is literally that's the last that's the first issue the, the last issue of this story is the first issue I read and then it moves swiftly on to Guggenheim's run and Guggenheim's run is I'm really enjoying it because it's bringing back one of those elements of X-Men that I really 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 love the Shi'ar um, the Shi'ar or something that, that depending on the writer can be either handled exceptionally well or exceptionally poorly. For example, I think uh, Chris Claremont had like knew exactly what to do with the Shear. Uh, oh yeah. Um, I think that during the nineties there were a, a number of people who just had no idea what to do with the Shear. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking in particular of there was a, a post uh, onslaught story where they went into space and they were there for ages, or the stuff with Vulcan after that. I don't think that was particularly. Well, whoa, 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 whoa! No, no, no! I will, I will fight you tooth and nail on the Vulcan story. The Vulcan story is fantastic. The Vulcan story is Game of Thrones in fucking space. It's, um... I really, really dug on the Vulcan story and the fact that, you know, he was the third Summer's brother. Spoilers. Um... <laughs> that, that, um... He was essentially... I just, I just, I really dug that character. Um, I dug the idea behind him. I dug the fact that he's another uh, fine, another absolutely gorgeously fine example of Xavier being an absolute shitheel. I mean, he wiped Vulcan out of everyone's memory. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, Scott, I, I, you might have a brother out there. I know you're an orphan and all, but uh, uh, you know what? No, you don't remember him. There you go. Yeah, that's... Uh, like, we need to cut just some... They come up with a list of all the fucking really shitty things. I'd love to do a podcast based entirely around the shit heel acts that <laughs> that Charles Xavier did over the year. I'd gladly do the, the the research on that. Yeah, no, I can off the top of my head in the first hundred issues, uh, faked his death, had the existence of mimic from the X Men, uh, had the existence of what's her name. Uh, what he called? He the existence of his own son. So it's on secretly in love with teenage girl. Uh, <laughs> Uh, secretly, really. Publicly in love with teenage girl. Uh, <laughs> uh, secret first member of the X Men, not revealed until forty years later. Yeah. Uh, um, Jesus uh, had a had a secret kid with Mystique. Yeah. It turned out to be a shit heel kid. Um, secretly married Mystique. <laughs> secretly um, turned off the powers of the most powerful mutant on the planet because he didn't want to deal with that shit. But embrace all of the mutants. We must embrace all of the mutants. No, not that one. Uh, no, fuck that one. Not him. Fuck him. No, fuck that one. That, that one's a shit. Get over there. Fuck off. Had, fuck off. Had a secret sister that ended up killing eight million mutants. Oh really? He, uh, he did that in the womb. <laughs> in the womb. In the womb. <laughs> <laughs> Right, this is where we'll table this discussion for another time. We're, we're spiraling. So, this story uh, starts with uh, the arrival of, uh, or the arrival, I should, no, that's a bad way to put it. You know the way there's that big sword space station knocking around in um, the orbit around Earth? That's right, that, you know, that uh, it's in orbit and shows up only when they need it. Yeah, well, you know, Marvel needed it for a storyline, so. For some reason, they discover floating just outside of the main window of the of Sword, uh, Sword's bridge, uh, randomly out of nowhere appears the rapidly dying body of uh, Deathbird. Deathbird, for those who don't know the name, because she only shows up every couple of decades, um, is the sister, evil sister of former Empress of the Shi'ar, Lalandra, um, and fr from when last we saw her she was paralyzed and being tortured by the current ruler of the Shi'ar, Gladiator. Um, so her return is a bit of, is what gets this story going. The reason for that is because the only person that they think is powerful enough that might be able to access her mind is her niece, Rachel Gray. So S.W.O.R.D. summons this particular team of X-Men up to um, their watchtower, watch whatever they call it. Um, and essentially shit kicks off we find out that Deathbird is not only not paralyzed but pregnant 
um, and therefore in possession of the blood rightful heir to the Shi'ar throne um, and on the run from the Shi'ar it's it's a classic kind of space chase featuring the X-Men and I like it I like it a lot it's um, I, I don't think there's a bad X-Men book at the moment um, and I'm, I'm delighted to say that because X-Men is probably my single greatest comic book influence from my younger days I devoured X-Men by the ton when I was young and I like coming back to X-Men knowing that it's it's in safe hands yeah. and it is in safe hands at the moment it's telling some really good stories it's really challenging some of the lead characters before they killed off Wolverine I thought they were really positioning themselves well to make Wolverine and Cyclops the Magneto and Charles Xavier of their generation and I don't think when you know back when the original stories were written uh, about Wolverine and Cyclops having a rivalry back then if people were to look at it if one were to go good and one were to go bad it would have been Wolverine to go bad and Cyclops to stay that true and true character that he is and to have pulled that flip in such a way that he's not really a villain but he's not really a hero anymore either I'd call Scott Summers a revolutionist and yeah Scott Summers is the Russell Brand of the X-Men Oh, dude, I was just trying to make him sound cool. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, a lot of the X-Men are in good places. Now, it's, uh, without wanting to sound like a broken record, I think that a lot of the time the X-Men titles run hot and cold. They're either good, really, really good, or uh, as op- really, bad. really, really bad. Now, Operation Zero Tolerance bad. Oh, God, the dirt worst. Now, a couple, a couple, a couple of things that I've picked up on that haven't really rang true for me. Um, Go. Okay, firstly, uh, Storm. I was reading the blurb. I picked up an issue of her solo series the other day, and it was like Storm and the bloody, 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 blah, reeling from the death of her lover Logan, and that was sort of it sort of sent out an alarm bell in my head and said, "Yeah, hang on a second and I checked back, and about in one issue of uh, X Men, uh, Wolverine and the X Men, like a year and a half ago. Although you know, Storm said to Wolverine, "Come on, give us a haircut here, and also sure while we're doing it, let's have a lot of sex." And that seemed this is this is that sort of where did, you know where did that come from? You know, like, uh, that came from a bad breakup of marriage with the Black Panther. Yeah, but it, she was going but it's his face. again, it struck me as being sort of very shoehorned in with a lot of the relationships in the X Men. They, they seem to make sense or they seem to grow in a sort of not not organically but they seem to develop and you, you can go yeah okay I accept that you know and to me that one seemed like a really 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 odd mix and it just didn't ring true for me which is weird because I've always thought Storm and Cypha and Storm and Logan should be together I've always thought that um and maybe that comes from the X-Men cartoon version of Days of Future Past that I watched where there's a future version of them her with Mohawk that is uh, that they are together and it always made kind of a sense to me that that make that I don't know that actually does make sense to me um, I, I don't know it seems of all the did you see who coloured the book though more importantly I, I, I haven't seen who coloured it but I would guess it was Jordi Belair no 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 it was Ruth Redmond uh, she's been colouring the storm uh, good yeah, good. Well, if if not if not Jordy, then her Padawan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, next. Member of Wayne Talbot's baseball league. Pardon? Yeah, jo- um, Ruth Redmond has taken up baseball. Yeah, we know your secret, Ruth. We know. Yeah. Uh, well, there was some other X Men stuff, but uh, I can't quite remember what it is. I'm sorry. I'm still reeling from my earlier injuries. Uh, <laughs> Tell them of your earlier injuries. I know we alluded to it at the start of the podcast. I was in the bath, right? Because uh, I like to be clean for a podcast, you know. And uh, we like to get dirty in this podcast. I, I was <laughs> scrambling around for something in the bath, and I lifted up a tiny little travel-sized uh, shaving gel container, and those things are very highly pressurized. And I accidentally <laughs> shot. Uh, <laughs> shaving gel directly into my eye and oh there was water everywhere and Game of Thrones and oh it was just horrible and now there's like shaving foam coming out of my eyes and also my nose and I think my mouth as well and it's just horrible we'll post pictures to the page like <laughs> <laughs> good hell uh, we're gonna 
it. <laughs> We're going to try something different this evening. This this might be uh, a, a folly, but we're uh, we're, we're going to take we're going to we're going to take some calls. Um, so uh, ooh, the, the, this this might become a uh, a regular feature. It might not, but uh, we're, we're going to. We're going to bring. Well, it depends on our listeners and our callers. Let's see how this works out. I have no idea what's about to happen. Uh, yeah, we're we're sort of going into the uh, we're going into the unknown here, right? Uh, For whatever reasons, Ray, call it fate, call it luck, call it karma. I believe that everything happens for a reason. I believe that we were destined to get thrown out of this dump. For what purpose? to go into business for ourselves. This ecto-containment system that Spengler and I have in mind is going to require a load of bread to capitalize. Where are we going to get the money? I don't know. I don't know. Dead air. No? Ah, Tom Kelly! Oh! Tom Kelly, you are the first ever, uh... The, the first ever uh, call in on the 2D cast. How are you? I am good. I feel privileged. Excellent. You wanted to talk about uh, Kingsman, the Secret Service. Yeah, um, I was just saying to, to yourself earlier, Kieran, that I, I got to see it at the weekend. Uh, just thought it was an absolutely fantastic movie. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I, I saw the trailer for it like uh, about six months ago and I thought, this looks appalling. And then all, the, like, all over the last week, I've been hearing the most. Amazing review. So why don't you give us a rundown of it? Yeah, uh, it's a comic book movie that's based on a book by Mark Millar and uh, Dave Gibbons. Actually just called The Secret Service. But it's about a young man named Eggsy who is picked up by Colin Firth's character um, and in the hopes to train him as a new member of the Kingsman after one of their uh, members dies in uh, a really uh, cool sequence that involves a lot of uh, <laughs> kung fu and slicing of people. Uh, but what happens then is the kind of typical fish out of water story where um, Eggsy has to kind of come up against a lot of different uh, uh, challenges coming from a more kind of council background than the, way the rest of his break it down here if I may interrupt you Tom the, uh, yeah. the way that I would describe this movie uh, is essentially a chav goes to James Bond school pretty much that's what it is but it's amazing um, I've read the comic book I've only seen snippets of the film I'm looking forward to seeing it this week but don't be afraid to spoil it first Tom we're, we're that kind of podcast um, okay. <laughs> it's, it looks like it's a really really good film it's got some really really good cameos from what I'm understanding and I'm going to ask it because I haven't actually talked to somebody who's seen it yet how's Mark Hamill Mark Hamill's actually really good he he's actually yes. a little a little understated like he, it, the scene where he's in at the start he's uh, kind of you know shaken and a little uh, scared of, of what's going on in front of him but he's not in it for very long and um I don't need him to be in it for very long. I want to see more Luke Skywalker this year. So yeah. <laughs> um, having listened to you on the uh, podcast earlier, I, I understand what? where that's going from. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll speak of no ill here. <laughs> but it's a great movie. It's a really camp send up of the old James Bond movies from the sixties and seventies, and it, it just Jane kind Goldman of Jane Goldman is the writer from her, yeah, Jane Goldman. Yeah, she is. Yeah class uh, right. also wrote X-Men first class for uh, Matthew Bond as well yeah, so like the, the, two, the two of them really combine really well and um, just the cinematography and everything for that movie is just fantastic there's a great bunch of action sequences where you get to just see the kind of joy in Colin Firth especially uh, really looks like he's enjoying himself throughout a lot of the set pieces um, would you say it was uh, a, a good date movie? Because uh, I like to take my lady to the cinema. You know, I like to I like to treat her nice. When I'm not forgetting that I'm marrying her later this year, I like to treat her. I like to treat her well. Uh, that that one was for Kim Kim Brosnan. So, um, is 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 it a good uh, is it a good movie for the ladies? Well, the ladies get Colin Firth. The men get a lot of action. Uh, I I would say yes. I brought my girlfriend to see it, and she wasn't she hadn't seen or heard anything about it. And she really enjoyed it at the end. And what about young Eggsy? Is he a handsome fellow? He would be a bit of a. He wouldn't be a, a bad looker, if I must say. 
Well, you know, I'm, you, you've, you've sold me on it. Uh, I, I think I'm going to give this a try. Uh, any other topics uh, you want to cover uh, in general before we kick you off? Because we've got other people to talk to and we hate you as well. Ah, oh, well. Uh, well, based on uh, a few people's recommendations, I've actually signed up to the WWE Network, and I know you guys are going to probably go into a bit more detail. Oh, uh, we, we, we've talked it. What do you think? <laughs> I, I've literally only just signed up now, so I'm going to probably relive a lot of okay. my uh, okay. teen years. I gave a quick rundown earlier on of, of the... I've, been, I've had it since Saturday, and I have pretty much, I realized, watched nothing but it since Saturday. Um, <laughs> if, if you're into it, check out uh, the NWO documentary is real good. Uh, all of the ECW documentaries are really good. Uh, there's a whole string of ECW TV. Um, uh, there's a whole string of Monday Night War documentaries that are fantastic. Um, and, I, and, of course, they have the full back catalog of WCW, ECW and WWE pay-per-views. It's go check it out man. Get get stuck in. I say my advice my, my advice would be uh, the live stream that they have is something really cool to have on if if you're not doing uh, if you're doing something that you can't really give your entire focus to it the live stream is really excellent to have on in the background just as as something, you know, just as background noise effectively. Awesome. Uh, I look forward to it. Um, so thanks very much. I listen and thank you for thank you for calling uh, you win a prize. Oh really? Yes, I have to say I don't know what the prize is yet. It'll be something I don't want from a loot crate. Issue one of Star Wars. <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> That'll be my third issue. <laughs> uh, what did you guys think of the issue? Really good. Uh, I loved it, man. Loved it, man. Uh, second one is out tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to be running up to Dublin City Comics and Collectibles to pick it up. Super cool. Okay, listen. Thank you very much for being the the very first caller ever in the show. Yay! Thanks very much, guys. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. That went well. Um, it it wasn't it wasn't a disaster. Let's see one last <laughs> one last thing. Uh, next week we're back to our sacred cows, in which we uh, look over a previously uh, considered beautiful uh, piece of genre fiction and see whether it deserves its lofty standing. And uh, Kieran, uh, what do you want to go for? Oh really? It's my choice. Okay. Um, well, Bobby's not here, so it has to be your choice. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Brave Star. Mm, okay. Well, the not, next. Not lofty okay. enough. Not lofty enough. Well, Transformers Generation One. Transformers Generation One. Next week we will be looking, therefore, at the very first ever episode of Transformers: uh, Arrival from Cybertron, uh, or as it was known wrongly in the United States, more than meets the eye, and uh, casting our critical aspersions on that. See you next week. Bye-bye.